So one thing I focus on when I'm scanning people is, um, you know, I try to focus on what, what the common area of injuries are. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been scanning a lot of Liz Frank injuries, mm -hmm. right? A lot of metatarsal injuries, mm -hmm. but with the Sasquatch foot that you had in your diagram, right. pushing off like this, mm -hmm. I mean, are we looking at ligaments maybe like inverted or, nope. or are they different and, and nope. the potential of injury, is it different in, in the Sasquatch? Well, surely the potential of injury is different because you don't have uh, an arch with the tarsals and metatarsals in, in a very limited range of motion. So whenever you limit motion, you're going to have greater stability, but you're going to have more That's potential true. for injury as a result of, of uh, you know, hyper movements, hyper extension or hyper flexion. So in the Sasquatch foot, it's, it, it, the, the trouble is, um, and, and I've dealt with clinicians who just could not, you know, ex your present company excluded, <laughs> who could not get it through their head that we're not talking about an alteration of the human foot. We're talking about the uh, normal anatomy of a non-human hominoid foot that is plantigrade, and uh, you know, I, I had uh, this one. Uh, he was a podiatrist, and he uh, arguing with me that you can't have a foot that does that. It w the person wouldn't be able to walk. Well, a person might not be able to walk. I said, but if you ever looked at a chimpanzee, they have a foot like that, and they walk and do all sorts of acrobatic um, uh, uh, movements with uh, with a great deal of power. Um, I said, you have to stop thinking in the mold of human pathology. So it, the, uh, just as with a chimp, I mean, look at here, you can see, for example, um, a real simple comparison. Look at the difference in the head of the talus. See, oh there's yeah. hardly any articular surface exposed there because the navicular essentially rotates a little bit, but it doesn't ride up back or, or, for, or forth. But here, look at the extension of that articular surface square up onto the neck. That means that the navicular can ride clear up. Now this is wired, I can't really show it, but it can ride up like that. Well, what is that motion? That's the mid-tarsal break. So basically what it evolved in the, in the chimp for, as the chimp is holding on to a vertical support, the forefoot is acting in prehension, the hind foot then has to lever. That provides the leverage and, and propulsion. And so there has to be some decoupling. Maybe it's too extreme, but uh, some independence of movement between the hind foot and the forefoot. And that takes place through flexion, extension, and rotation, the talonavicular joint. A little bit of flexion and extension, but mostly a twisting movement at the calcaneocuboid joint. Um, in in the foot. When they come to the ground then it's expressed as the mid-tarsal break hmm. with the heel coming up, flexion across this compound joint and push off, you know, the, it's push off is a whole different mechanism with a chimp walking on the ground quadrupedally. But in the Sasquatch foot essentially you've retained a, the flat anatomy with the hyper mobile midfoot and just lost the adduction, or abduction, excuse me, gained the adduction of the, the great toe. Um, the flat, archless foot avoids concentration of pressure, plantar pressure, under these limited areas of contact, mm -hmm. um, and instead spreads it out over the entire foot, and, and the Sasquatch has a relatively broader foot, so its breadth to length ratios are, are outside of human variation. Even for its size, I mean, yeah. proportional to its yeah. size, the Sasquatch so, yeah. would have a bigger foot for its size. Exactly. Well, yes, to a degree. Now, you can only do so much. I mean, obviously, you can't walk around with swim fins on, and the, right. the mechanics of that. So, but the, the, the breadth is, is greater, and, and Krantz pointed this out um, very clearly in his book, what he didn't add to that was that in addition to the anatomical adaptations, there are behavioral adaptations. So imagine you know, you've got a 70 pound pack. Well, how do you tend to walk when you're, especially when you're on uneven ground? You tend to flex a little bit, right? You mm -hmm. take it up in your knees and hips. That's called a compliant gait or sometimes a groucho for groucho Marx who famously always, you know, walked like 
stooped over like this with his cigar. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if Sasquatch adopts that kind of a posture, then you can take advantage of the elastic storage properties of the tendons and ligaments mm. in, the, in the joints and of, of the, the whole extremity from the hips, the knees, the ankles, the plantar uh, aponeurosis and uh, long and short plantar ligaments, etc., etc. all the ligaments of the joints. That would also have to do with the placement of the, hip, the femur in the hips, correct? Like it's a little, it's a little different than it than ours and its walk. Uh, I remember the um, well. There's this walleye uh, that uh, walk that uh, that Doug Hycheck drew attention to, mm -hmm. and whether that's normal or whether that's uh, maybe a pathology. Uh, I mean, the the fact of the herniation, etc., yeah. suggests that she may have been injured mm -hmm. uh, or suffered some. You know, a herniation like that can be from a traumatic, penetrating injury. It, uh, you can also have breakdown of connective tissue, including the fascia lata, with some disease states like tuberculosis, um, you know, which primates are susceptible to. So there's, a, there's other possible interpretations of that, but she does have uh, some distinctive... I mean, <clears throat> in Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, the documentary, Hycheck kind of exaggerated. You know, I've had mm -hmm. conversations with the fellow who did the animation of the skeleton. Now his name escapes me for just a moment, but uh, in talking with him, he said, yeah, he said, I can see what he was referring to, but you know, he had me exaggerated. So he mm -hmm. had this kind of uh, knock need and, and when the leg was lifted, because the uh, proportions of the leg and especially the foot relative to the lower leg, the leg, um, were greater, in order to clear the toes, you see the foot sort of angle outward. It's mm -hmm. abducted. And, and that motion itself, too, would tend to direct the knee inward a little bit, and, uh, and so on. So he drew attention to this walleye. I think that's not, I think that's more idiosyncratic for Patty, yeah. quite honestly. Um, I also feel it's slightly attributed to walking on the sand. Well, that can be, too, yeah. I mean, especially when you're sinking in an inch and a half, mm -hmm. it's two inches into the into that sand, uh, then that's going to affect your uh, your gait as compared to you know we tend to always think take as the as the baseline mm -hmm. walking on a smooth even surface like <laughs> at the floor of a laboratory or or a paved sidewalk. Mm -hmm. That's why you know the slightest little unevenness in a section of sidewalk can trip you up mm -hmm. because we just lift, we exert just enough energy to barely clear our, our toes uh, when we're in the swing phase and just a little irregularity in the surface can snag it and mm -hmm. send us sprawling. That's so why you always trip on a rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's kick a rock, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, with uh, the cripple foot cast yeah. that, um, that Dr. Krantz had, yeah. I'll see that from time to time in a patient, and it's almost always a lower back injury. Yeah. Is that what he attributed well, that to? Or? He did not. He didn't know that about that. Uh, Krantz didn't. This is pre-MRI. Uh, so. But, but I, yeah, <laughs> I guess. I, I drew attention um, to that. My, my, uh, one of my distant second cousins, uh, another Meldrum from Canada, was down at Brigham Young University when I was studying there. He was a couple of years ahead of me. He became an orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I shared with him, at one point he saw me on a TV documentary and reached out and uh, uh, got back in contact. And uh, can, I, can I send you a particular case? Would you, would you evaluate something for me? Oh, sure. So I sent him a photo of uh, the one that uh, Rene de Hinden had done with, that had the, the uh, two yardsticks in the background, nice black background, excellent photograph of these two casts, the original casts. Mm -hmm. um, he was all excited and he said, uh, <laughs> he said, if I was presented with this case and the patient uh, had the expression of this pathology only unilaterally, I would tend to rule out a congenital deformity, which leaves a crushing injury or a spinal cord lesion. Mm -hmm. He said, I would immediately send the patient to have an MRI evaluation of their lower spine. 
he said, you know when and where this was taken? Could you, you know, it's a small town maybe. This was back before all the FERPA and uh, HIPAA and all that stuff. And uh, he said, could you could maybe ask if there was a patient that had a spinal cord uh, um, MRI study that had a foot deformity? And I said, well, you know, I might be able to, but the guy would have to have 17 and a half inch feet. <laughs> and there's this pregnant pause on the other end of the line. He goes, oh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> he was so <laughs> taken with the anatomy that he totally forgot, uh, overlooked the, yeah. the, the, the scale. Mm -hmm. And about two weeks later, I got a call from his boss, his attending. He was doing an internship. And uh, hit, uh, Russell, my cousin's specialty, was knee, knee and hip replacements. And his attending was the foot specialist of the group. Mm -hmm. So he calls me up, and, and uh, we chatted for better than an hour, you know, talking about all the possible ins and outs of, of what this could mean as far as the pathology and so forth and the anatomy. And then he, but this final closing, I, and I don't remember the gist of the whole conversation, the details, I remember the gist, but not the details. But his final statement was, he says, I hope you don't mind, but I sort of imposed on Russell, he let me have that photo that you sent, and I had it framed and it hangs in my office. Yeah. And every few months when we cycle in another set of, of, attend, of, uh, of uh, interns, yeah. Um, this is the first case that I had them evaluate. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you know, for him, it was, it wasn't. It, it didn't have the uh, baggage of the implications of what the reality of this would mean for for science.